Justice League didn't hold back on any of the big moments. We had a planet-threatening disaster, a team of superheroes determined to stop it, and a good old-fashioned race between Superman and Flash. Now that justice has been served on the big screen, we're doing justice to the little moments and small details you may have missed in Justice League. Spoilers ahead. Crisis Cameo Early in the film, you may have caught that newspaper headline for the Metropolis Post asking if a bunch of fallen heroes returned to their own planets. What you may not have noticed was the smaller headline beside the main story, Citywide Crisis. In the DC Universe, a crisis is kind of a big deal, and DC doesn't throw the C-word around casually. It started in Justice League of America No. 21 with the Crisis on Earth 1 storyline. In the very next issue, there was Crisis on Earth 2. Later, 1985's game-changing Crisis on Infinite Earth story arc put the entire multiverse in peril. Various crises even popped up after that, like Infinite Crisis, Identity Crisis, and Final Crisis. Basically, most of DC Comics history has been defined by crises, so name-dropping the word in a DCEU movie is definitely a piece of fan service. Smooth Finish for the majority of the movie, Cyborg had a notably different look than he does in the comics. Most versions of Cyborg in the comics have a smooth, aerodynamic exterior. In Justice League, however, Cyborg had sharp edges sticking out everywhere, like a sentient pile of cutlery. But at the end of Justice League, Vic uses his growing control over the Motherbox tech to give himself a makeover, ditching the Robocop 2 vibe for a polished shell lifted straight from the comics. And while we're on the topic of Cyborg, booyah! Throughout Cyborg's run on Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go, Sparky has had one distinguishing catchphrase. Just practicing my booyahs! Boo 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 ya 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 booyah! It takes most of Justice League to get there, but right at the end, he drops his big line, giving at least some of the audience a reason to get out of their seats with a smile. Booyah! If you've never come across Cyborg in any form before Justice League, you'd never know what all the fuss was about. Booyah! Mira. Amber Heard's character Mira didn't get a ton of screen time in Justice League, but the costume designers definitely paid homage to Mira's comics wardrobe. From her crown to her green-scaled armor, the likeness is exact. Unfortunately, Justice League left the fate of Mira and the nature of her relationship with Aquaman up in the air. But since Amber Heard is slated to star in the upcoming Aquaman film, it looks like we'll get to see what finally happens with the future Queen of Atlantis. Red Sky of Doom Leading up to the climax of Justice League, Steppenwolf takes the mother boxes back to that little Russian town to start his apocalypse terraforming picnic. And the sky turns blood red. On the surface, that red sky is pure apocalypse. Steppenwolf's turning Earth into a version of his reddish world, after all. But under the surface, that red sky represents very DC-specific levels of doom. Leading up to, and during the crisis on Infinite Earth storyline, DC comic artists started coloring the skies red in their other comic books. Most of the time, that was the only tie-in, which is the reason panels like this showed up in comics like Swamp Thing. So while those red skies made sense in the movie, they also represented DC's classic way of saying, big things are going down. Gorilla Sign Language If you could give The Flash an iconic nemesis that wasn't another speedster, it would undoubtedly be Gorilla Grodd, a hyper-intelligent ape who's got a hyper-personal vendetta against The Flash. Obviously, there weren't any giant gorillas in Justice League, but there was a mention of that classic villain, albeit briefly. When Bruce Wayne tracks down Alan, the super speedster tries to convince Wayne that he's not really the Flash, which leads to this line. Fluent in sign language? Gorilla sign language? For fans of the comics, it was immediately obvious that Alan was referring to Grodd, the greatest gorilla in the DC Universe. At least outside of Jack and Apes, the Joker's adopted gorilla's son. But this was much more likely a sly reference to Grodd. Cold Resistance In that same scene where Bruce Wayne first meets Barry Allen, there are a ton of things going on in the background. If you weren't paying attention to the Rick and Morty episode, you might have noticed something else on one of those screens. Look closely at the monitor directly behind and to the left of Ezra Miller, and pay attention to the words at the top. Cold Resistance Clearly, Barry has been testing his suit's tolerance for a chill, and one particular Flash villain comes to mind when you think of Cold. Captain Cold, aka Leonard Snart one of Flash's deadliest villains. Does this mean that Flash has already defeated Captain Cold in this universe? Or was he gearing up for a confrontation when Steppenwolf, uh, stepped on everyone's plans? We just don't know. Ace Chemicals There were a good handful of Easter eggs emblazoned on the buildings throughout the film, one of which was a small neon sign advertising Ace Chemicals. And if you know your comic's history, you know where this is going. Yup, 
Ace Chemicals is the chemical plant where the Joker fell into a toxic vat and became, well, the Joker. It's gone by different names and different versions of the origin story. It was called Access Chemicals in 1989's Batman, and oddly, Monarch Playing Card Company in the original run of Detective Comics. But Ace Chemicals is now DC canon for the name of the birthplace of the Joker. In Justice League, the sign is a blink and you'll miss a detail, but it's a nice touch on the world building of the movie. Gotham Gargoyle Nothing says Batman like standing on a gargoyle high above Gotham on a dark, stormy night. If you could put that image in a bottle, it'd smell like the inside of Batman's cowl. Guaranteed. So the shot of Batman on a Grim Reaper gargoyle in the Justice League Comic-Con trailer was a definite crowd-pleaser. If you've done your homework and read all gazillion issues of Detective Comics, you might recognize that Reaper image. The shot is a direct homage to the cover of Detective Comics number 682. Ancient King After Steppenwolf's first invasion of Earth, the three mother boxes were split among the races. The Atlanteans and Amazons built cool little shrines for their boxes. But the men, being men, decided they couldn't trust anyone, so they buried theirs out in the woods. IMDB only lists the main guy there as the Ancient King of Men. There's one particular ancient king of men who definitely plays a role in the DC Universe, King Arthur. Most of the mythological lore of King Arthur is kept intact in the DCU, so it's definitely possible that he was the one who would be entrusted with the Mother Box after a war that happened hundreds of years ago. Super Plaid Superman is the worst at disguises, but that's part of who he is, so we're all okay with that by now. Then, somewhere along the line, live-action adaptations of Superman decided that he also needed to add plaid to his repertoire of implausibly common wardrobe choices. Maybe it's because he grew up on a farm in Kansas, and that's what farmers wear. Whatever the reason, old Clark's been putting on plaid whenever he visits the family farm ever since 1978 Superman. It's usually red, but not always. It was white in Superman 4 and white again in Superman Returns. Man of Steel got nervous and put his mom in plaid, but oh, there's Clark wearing plaid again in Batman vs. Superman. All the way in Metropolis, too. Some of his shirts have some of the plaid in them, so there's a little reminder of the, uh, the Midwestern boy from Kansas. And who can forget the CW Smallville, a show that spent more on plaid than Sister Act's entire budget for nun costumes. Which brings us back to Justice League, where Clark heads out to the farm in Smallville to talk to Lois, in plaid. Even though she totally knows who he is, and he can just wear the suit with a big S. She just called him Clark in front of a dozen policemen while he was supermanning the Super Friends. So why did he change to plaid? Because it's an Easter egg. Look, the bottom line is, if you ever see a guy anywhere wearing plaid, there's a 30% chance it's Superman. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.